Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Celebration Church. We are glad that you are joining us today for worship, and we would uh, love to have you uh, just relax, but also uh, open your heart to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and worship Him with all of your heart with us. Uh, we know you're at home, or maybe you're traveling. We're not sure where you are, but you are not here with us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't engage uh, right now wherever you're at in worship. We want to. We strongly recommend just diving in with the worship team and uh, and worshiping with us. And we are really looking forward to getting back together. But in the meantime, let's give him honor and glory and praise this morning. Let's go before him in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you that your joy comes in the morning. We thank you that even though the sorrow endures for the, for the night, your joy is new and your mercy is new every morning. God, we thank you for this. We give you glory and honor. And Lord, I pray that as we worship at our home uh, or in our car, or wherever we are, Lord, I, I pray that your presence would be made known and that your goodness would be made known. Lord, we give you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. In the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, bending every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
to be praised, God. We set our eyes on you and not the things on this world. What is happening, we praise you. We look to you, Jesus, and we praise you. In the midst of fear, in the midst of uncertainties, we look to you because you always deserve to be praised. You deserve to be praised. We praise your holy name, Jesus. Psalm 31 through 3. <laughs> I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is only but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. When I was prosperous, I said, nothing can stop me now. Your favor, O Lord, made me as secure as a mountain. Then you turned away from me, and I was shattered. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Good morning again. I hope you enjoyed the video uh, of Psalm 30 and 
Uh, those are some of the teens and youth from Celebration Church. Uh, they've been meeting, doing different Zoom meetings and uh, getting together that way. And we wanted to do Psalm 30 uh, from the kids because it's Mother's Day and it's a, it's a good opportunity for mom to smile and be proud. Um, but it's also uh, really a good psalm about uh, how God is faithful always. Um, weeping and during for a night, joy comes in the morning. So that was awesome. Also, just so you know, at the end of the live stream uh, t this morning, stick around. We're going to have uh, kind of an announcement video uh, to do church announcements. I know you all have missed bulletins and announcements and all of those things. So this morning on Mother's Day, as our gift to moms, we're going to have announcements uh, at the end of the service. Seriously though, happy Mother's Day. Uh, Mom, I love you. Uh, Jennifer, I love you. Uh, and all the moms, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Um, moms and dads get uh, less credit than they deserve. And moms, uh, in particular, in this world and in this culture that we live in that demand so many things that are not rooted in a biblical worldview, bib uh, rooted in uh, a worldly, secular worldview that really demands a lot of things out of mom that uh, God never did demand. So moms, we want to encourage you, center your heart in what God looks uh, or what God expects out of motherhood and your heart will be at ease. It still isn't easy, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done as a mother, but center your heart, anchor your heart into the scriptural understanding of what a mother is, um, and you will be much more at peace uh, because you're going to be following what God wants. So this morning, we are going to get into our Genesis chapter 35, uh, our Genesis series and uh, we are going to be looking at the tail end, uh, really, of Jacob's narrative that's in Genesis. He's taken up quite a few chapters, um, and a lot of time has been spent with Jacob uh, because Jacob is the crooked stick of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and it's just really been amazing and, and powerful to look at what God has done in the life of Jacob uh, over these 20 years once he left uh, home and married uh, Leah and uh, Rachel and now he is headed back to the promised land and he's there and he's headed back to see his father um, and this chapter really ties uh, Jacob's uh, life together and it, and it really shows how God has worked in his life, his plan, his purpose. And uh, this chapter, if you wanted to title my sermon today, would be Sorrowful Rejoicing. Uh, because God um, really mingles his blessing in the midst of a lot of sorrow in chapter 35. If you wanted to look up uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, you would find a great phrase there, where the Apostle Paul says that we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And, and it's, it is a mingling together of two, it's a juxtaposition, if you want to use a fancy word. Uh, it's a mingling together of two seemingly opposites. Uh, sorrowful and rejoicing do not typically go together. Uh, however, in the Christian life and in our walk with God, they frequently go together. There is uh, sorrow frequently mixed in with our rejoicing. And uh, you're going to see that as a theme in chapter 35. We're going to do it a little different th uh, this morning. I'm going to go uh, in chunks here or paragraphs. And uh, I want us to see what, um, what God is doing with Jacob. Now just as a reminder and review, uh, chapter 34 was brutal. It was horrible. Uh, Dina is raped, and as a result, um, uh, Simeon and Levi come in with deception and slaughter an entire uh, village or a city, a small town. And now uh, Jacob, at the very end of uh, chapter 34, is like, great, 
Uh, everybody is going to want to kill us. You made me stink in the nostrils of my neighbors. So that's the setting when we get into chapter 35. And let's dive in now. So God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob, they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. Let's stop there. First thing we want to see um, is the repentance and the rededication of sorts that Jacob has. Jacob has been on this journey, uh, and God really put him through a meat grinder uh, when he was under Laban, and he's escaped, and then the next meat grinder that he went through was the fear of Esau, and God delivered him there. And then chapter 34 is another horrific experience where Jacob um, maybe has grown lax. And we talked about this last week, that Jacob did not go to Bethel, which is in chapter 28, what he said that he would do. And since he stopped at Shechem in chapter 34, there was a terrible, terrible consequence for his not going the whole way. But now in chapter 35, you see, and I hope you can relate to this, I think we all can, you see how Jacob is in a mode of repentance and rededication. I think all of us have experienced this. We've had really uh, good times with God, like Jacob did, uh, wrestling with God and, uh, and having these incredible experiences with God and being renamed by God, uh, Israel. And then you have this lackadaisical or this lapse, it's this ebb and flow in your relationship with God, and, and something happens that causes you to notice and causes you to see that you are not where you're supposed to be. Jacob, you are supposed to be in Bethel. Why are you not there? God doesn't rebuke him, but he says, get up and go to Bethel and do uh, what you said you were going to do. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So, so God is calling him back to go where he should have went rather than stopping at Shechem. And before he leaves, before he goes, Jacob does this incredible thing. He turns to his family, and this is the first time that you see him leading his family. He says, let's get rid of all the junk. Let's get rid of the foreign gods, and let's do it now because we are not going to go build this altar for God. We are not going to go uh, there with this junk and this idolatry in our lives. So that is, that is really important. He, he says, purify yourselves and put on clean garments. Now, the question that I had was, why in the world did they have foreign gods? Now, if you remember, when Rachel fled from Laban, she did hide the gods of Laban's house, these little if you can imagine this, these little, I picture little toy figurines um, that are no gods at all, and it's silly, and I think the narrative wants it to be seen as silly. Uh, and she was able to hide them under the saddle uh, of the camel, and, and Laban never found the gods. Obviously, at this point, Jacob is aware that they are there, but they, it also mentions uh, at, in verse 4 that they pulled the rings out of their ears, a totally different cultural reference. There, you were pledging allegiance to different deities and um, different uh, different gods and showing yourself uh, who you were loyal to. And he says, we're getting rid of all of that. And they got rid of all that. So that means they probably were getting rid of the gods that Rachel had. And they were also, apparently, while they were here at Shechem, they had picked up some additional uh, local habits from the Canaanites. Um, and they got rid of all of it. That is so clearly applicable to our lives today that 
God will open our eyes and show us wonderful things from His law, or God will, by His Spirit, convict us. And in those moments, our response is, put away the foreign gods. Put away the, the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Put it away. Repent. And repent simply is what Jacob did here. Repentance is not just some emotional act uh, at an altar at a church. Repentance is the turning away from sin, but the turning toward God. In fact, the Jewish emphasis on repentance was always the turning towards God and returning to Him, and that is what Jacob is doing spiritually and literally, physically. He is going to Bethel where God met him at the first to build an altar, and he does not want any encumberments of any kind spiritual junk and he gets rid of it in their life there's something else in here um, that you that you notice and that is what he says in verse 3 he says let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone I love this sentence that Jacob has right here uh, in the scripture. He is telling the family. He is leading his family. Dads, I know this is Mother's Day, but dads, listen. Lead the family. You are supposed to do what Jacob's doing here. Hey, we aren't going to have this in our house, number one. Number two, let me tell you about who my God is. My God is the God who answers me, present tense, in the day of my distress, and has been, past tense, with me wherever I've gone. He's with me now, and he's been with me all throughout my entire life. And this Jacob that we see here saying this now is a Jacob that has seen God's faithfulness over the last 20 years and how God has blessed him, kept him, and protected him. Jacob's entire life was characterized by distress. Scared of Laban, scared of Esau, scared to see Esau again. Distress after distress after distress. And Jacob acknowledges, God has been with me the whole time. These, these poignant moments in our life where God kind of opens our eyes and, and maybe you've been there where you've said, what am I doing? What am I doing? That is really what this moment is. What am I doing? Why did I not go to Bethel? Now God's telling me to go, and now we're going to go, we're going to get rid of the idols, we're going to get rid of the junk, we're going to repent, and I am acknowledging, family, listen to me, I'm acknowledging this God of mine who answers me in, my, in the day of my distress, He's been with me wherever I have gone. It's awesome, it's a beautiful picture. That's what they do, they get rid of the gods, uh, they get rid of the earrings that signify uh, allegiance or worship of other gods and they hide them under the terebinth tree they don't keep them even though they could have sold them or got value out of them they just completely got rid of it now look at what happens next we're going to read uh, verses 5 through uh, 15 because we're going to see now God reaffirming his covenant in fact uh, this is this is an incredibly powerful uh, affirmation that God has to Jacob as a person, uh, and for the nation of Israel. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and the king shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. 
Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering and on it, uh, poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Of course, Bethel or Bethel, it means the house of God. And verses 5 through 15 is the reaffirmation of the covenant, but it's also another demonstration of the faithfulness of God. Jacob's just done this repentance and rededication uh, of, of the whole family, and they're doing what God wants. And as they leave, remember Jacob said, God is the God who answers me in the day of my distress. One of the things he was afraid of in chapter 34 is, hey guys, you made me stink to my neighbors and they're going to come after us and kill us and we don't have enough people to fend them off. And the very first thing in verse 5 you see is a terror from God fell upon the cities around them and they did not pursue the, uh, the sons of Jacob. This tells us that everybody had heard what had happened in chapter 34 where Jacob and his family had slaughtered uh, this entire village and they were planning to come after them but God supernaturally causes a fear a terror to fall on all of these uh, surrounding cities and nobody bothers them this is the victory this is the rejoicing that I mentioned at the beginning uh, there this is a great thing and they probably were wondering wow nobody's coming after us but then in verse 8 there's this just strangely mentioned Deborah Rebecca's nurse now who's Rebecca remember Rebecca is Isaac's wife it's Jacob's mom where did she show up she just comes out of nowhere and we don't know wh why she's here other than Rebecca must have sent Deborah this nurse uh, to be with Jacob at some point in the last 20 years and she was so beloved that they bury her near Bethel and they call the name of the place Alan Bakuth which means uh, weeping and so this is the sorrow that is mingled in the mixture of the rejoicing they have this great victory they have this great spiritual renewal and then somebody they love dies if this is not a picture of what it is like to serve and live for God I don't know what is this is this is real life following God and doing what he wants you to do does not equal everything is going to be perfect it does not equal nobody's ever going to get sick it does not equal nobody's ever going to die. It does not equal everything's always going to be exactly the way you want it to be. Serving God and following after Him means that God is faithful to get you where He wants you to go. He does a supernatural event here and causes all these people to leave Him alone, but Deborah dies, probably in her old age. She was probably older than Jacob, but it was still a sorrowful event in the middle of, of the victory verse 9 God appeared to Jacob again and he blessed him so now we're right back into the blessing we're right back into the rejoicing we're right back into the this is the faithfulness of God and God says something he's already said to him he are, when they wrestled uh, earlier I believe in chapter 33 uh, he already changed his name to Israel but now it's like a reminder your name is Israel, not Jacob the deceiver. Your name is Israel. So he called his name Israel. I love that. Look at the, the end of verse 10. Your, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. God declares, this is your name. This is who you are. And Moses records, so he called his name Israel. Now, think about it from Moses' point of view, writing this narrative. He is a, he's leading the nation of Israel, and he's now writing about the, uh, the consummation of the beginning of the nation of Israel, which is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, slash Israel. 
And I love what God says in verse 11. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You have a job to do, Jacob, which he's already done. He's already done. Jacob has already had uh, 11 children, and we're about to get into number 12. And he's already been fruitful and multiplied. However, what God is, is saying is, and he's clearly reaching back to uh, a, uh, Adam and Eve, which is he told them to be fruitful and multiply. What he's, what he's doing is he's, he's reaffirming that I am building a people and a nation out of you. And that is what he goes on to say. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. This is the first time that God has said it exactly this way to Jacob. And it is a throwback to what God had said to Abraham. And God is here giving the full bore reaffirmation, this is the covenant that I have with you, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, no longer Jacob, Israel. This, this is the covenant with you. Kingdoms, nations, companies of nations are going to come from you. This is the land that I'm giving to you and your offspring after you. And so that is how God reaffirms uh, what, what He has been saying throughout the book of Genesis, I am building a nation. I am creating a people, my own chosen people. I am doing it, and I started it with Abraham, and now Jacob with you. We're going to see the acceleration of how God does what he does in the building of the nation of Israel. And of course, Jacob does what we should always do when the blessing of God is in our life or when the blessing of God seems like it's not in our life, he worships. He builds an altar, and he pours out a drink offering on it, and he worships God. The chapter doesn't end here. Then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. So we've had victory, we had a death, we have more victory, we have God reaffirming the covenant, and now we have the hard labor of Rachel. I don't know exactly how old she is, but she's not a spring chicken any longer, and she's pregnant with who we know to be Benjamin. But listen to how this happens in verse 17. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have you have another son. So while in the middle of this labor, she knows this is a son. So the sex of the baby is apparent. If you any medical background, you can imagine maybe the baby was breech or maybe presenting feet first. I'm not sure the labor was hard enough that it causes Rachel to die. But the midwife, in the midst of this incredibly hard labor, she says, do not fear, for you have another son. Remember, uh, Rachel asked for another son after she had Joseph. And so the midwife, probably knowing that, wants to encourage her, knows what's going on. If she's a midwife, she has seen hard labor. This is not 2020. The mortality rate is probably 50% of all births end uh, in death of either the mother or the child. And the, this is a common occurrence that happened in this time. We are so blessed in the time in the world that we live in today. Verse 18, And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Ani, which means son of my sorrow. So she is at, in her dying breath saying his name should be Ben-Ani. He should be called the son of my sorrow because she knows what's happening. She knows that she is dying. But look at what Jacob does. But his father called him Benjamin, or Benjamin is what we would say. And that means son of my right hand. I want to come back to this. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So this is sorrow 
in the middle of the blessing. The blessing is a son that she had prayed for, and Jacob now has another son. And he loses his wife, whom he loved dearly. Rachel was his favorite wife, and the one that he originally wanted um, and had to work another seven years for. And she dies. This is the deepest of sorrows. But rather than focus on the sorrow, and rather than focus on the death, Jacob does not grant the dying wish of his wife to call him son of my sorrow, but instead to say, no, son of my right hand. You see in Jacob a shift. He is not the pessimistic deceiver that he was, but he is now someone who said earlier in the chapter, uh, in verse 5, I'm serving the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I've gone. And you start seeing the expression of that faith uh, in the way that Jacob is interacting. He's saying, no, we are not going to call him son of my sorrow. We're going to call him son of my right hand or son of my strength. And I think that is just a great picture of how God can work in our life that even in the midst of intense sorrow, there can be joy and faith and trust in God. Because Jacob at this point has seen enough that he knows that God's purposes and his plans are not going to be thwarted. They are not going to be stopped. And if in the providence of God that he receives a son and his wife passes away, he is not going to embitter his soul against God and say, why, why, why? Instead, he's going to say, no, this son is a gift, and I'm going to honor and trust my, my king, my God. But it's, it's still sorrowful. And, and again, you see, you see victory and blessing and sorrow and, um, and victory mixed together. And then something totally weird happens. It's verse 22. Excuse me while I turn pages on my notes. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben, his oldest son, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard of it. It It's just thrown in here. It's just this weird, terrible thing that Reuben, in some kind of lustful and power type move says I'm going to sleep with dad's concubine which was uh, like a second tier wife that he had children with um, and I'm going to take her as my own and that and that's all that is said but what this does uh, is this horrible disgusting thing that Reuben has done has paved the way for a guy named Judah, which we will get to later uh, in in the Genesis story. But you've heard of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus. Um, And all the royal line comes through Judah. And the reason this happens is is Levi and Simeon were uh, were the bloody murderers in chapter 34, and Reuben is the power grabbing, lustful oldest son. And they are the three oldest. The fourth oldest is Judah. And so the three oldest get moved out of the blessing when you get to Genesis 49. And it paves the way for uh, Judah to be the one who inherits the blessing. In fact, the, uh, the rest of Genesis is going to be really sets a stage between is God going to work through Joseph or is God going to work through Judah? And we know, actually, even though the rest of Genesis is dedicated to Joseph, we know that ultimately it's going to be Judah. But anyway, that's, that verse 22 just gets thrown in there, and then uh, it describes the 12 sons of Jacob uh, in verses uh, 23 and 24. And I want us to go to verse uh, 27. And Jacob came to his father's house at Mamre, or Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. He's finally made it home to dad. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So when he was 160, 20 years ago, they thought he was going to die, and he lives another 20 years. 
And Isaac breathed his last, and Jacob is there. And he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. There is something really cool about the full circle that is happening in chapter 35, and that is that the two brothers that had so many issues are there together, and they bury their father together. The, the story, God includes this on purpose to let everybody know that they finally, totally uh, had reconciled. And I imagine, be, because you, you've got to think, uh, Esau had a, a massive company of servants. Uh, Jacob had a massive company of servants. They could have had the servants bury Isaac. But they did it themselves. And I imagine they shared stories about their childhood as they did that. And it's really wonderful to see reconciliation, even in the midst of the sorrow of somebody passing away. Genesis 35 has three funerals. Deborah the servant, Rachel the beloved wife, and Isaac the patriarch and the father. But mingled in those, those terrible events and the other terrible event, uh, Reuben's uh, sleeping with uh, Jacob's concubine, mingled in there is the repentance of Jacob, the birth of Benjamin, the restoration of Jacob and Esau, and the reaffirmation of the covenant promise that God has. If you are living your life for the Lord, you should read Genesis 35 and say, you know what? What I considered to be the crazy up and down, why does it seem like victory one day and sorrow the next? You should read Genesis 35 and realize that this is the normal experience for a Christian. You know, Paul says that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, along the way, as we serve Him, and as we trust in Him, we are going to encounter sorrowful events. But those events can be something that God uses to shape us and mold us rather than being things that Satan uses to destroy us. I want to encourage you this morning to realize that God is taking us somewhere. And as we go with Him, His purposes are going to stand his covenant promises are going to stand. There's perhaps uh, weeping tonight, but in the morning there is rejoicing. You need to have your faith and hope in God who is going to work all of these things together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. He will get us where He wants to get us. What we need to do is not give up not lose heart and trust in Him. Even if you're in the midst of a period of sorrow, read Genesis 35 and realize God doesn't leave us in places of sorrow, but they are mingled in with the blessings that He brings. Trust Him. Put your hope in Him. Put your faith in Him. He's going to carry us through. We love you guys. I hope you've said hello to somebody. Uh, stick around. We have some announcements coming up. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just got done preaching, and now I'm giving announcements, which is backwards because we all know that God's prescribed order of service is to do worship and then announcements. And you have to have bulletins. And we don't have any of that right now. So here's the announcements. Uh, really, uh, just one uh, really important announcement. Uh, we had an elder uh, meeting this week, and we, uh, after prayer and discussion, uh, feel like it is going to be best for us to meet again as a church all together on June the 7th, uh, which is obviously the first Sunday in June. And we want to uh, begin just getting everybody uh, mentally prepared that that's when we're going to do it. Um, obviously, if anyone is uncomfortable or has health issues, uh, you are not going to be judged at all if you stay home. Uh, we realize for a lot of people that this has just been um, 
it's unprecedented and dealing with it as best that we can. But we, we do feel like June 7th would, will be a great time to get back together. Um, and uh, as of right now, uh, we did consider doing it a little earlier, but some of the restrictions, some of the regulations um, just did not seem like uh, it would be advantageous to have a service where we couldn't hardly have a service. So we, when we get back together, we want to get back together. We want to celebrate uh, together, and that is our plan on June the 7th. Stay tuned. Uh, I don't have a, an official time for this now, but we will in the coming weeks. Uh, we're going to have a deep clean of the sanctuary and of the building and of the kids' rooms, so we might need your help. Uh, so we'll be reaching out to some of you. If you'd like to volunteer, please let us know. Um, also, we are going to have, and I don't have a date for this yet, but I'm just letting you know, we have multiple people that want to get baptized, which is so exciting. So we are going to have a date for that in the very, very near future. It will be happening in June. So all of you that uh, wanted to get uh, baptized, we are ready to rock and roll. So we'll give you some more information on that in the near future. Thank you. God bless you. Enjoy Mother's Day. Love you, Mom.